Thank you so much, Brittany. And to actually, we have a, um, a variety of Armed Forces Insurance Military Spouse of the Year winners here today. So just um, if you say one, see one, say hi. No, we have Brian up here. OK, guys, so at military.com, I get to read a lot of studies, OK? And I love them. I'm so nerdy. I cover TRICARE. You got to be nerdy, <laughs> OK? I love them all. But when I heard about this most recent study, my nerdy self took a back seat and my practical self uh, stepped forward. Because let's be honest, sometimes, even to the nerdy, research can be a little boring, OK? Well, I'm excited to tell you that the research you're about to hear about today is not boring. In fact, not only that, but it has some practical things that we need to hear as a military spouse community about us and about who we are. To do this report, the USO and Marvin Strategies traveled the world talking to military spouses just like you and me to find out what we have to say. To introduce this today, please welcome USO CEO and President J.D. Crouch. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Welcome to everybody, but particularly welcome to our military spouses. And I, I can feel the energy, the enthusiasm. It's, it's really good. And so thank you for, for what you're doing. You know, we're going to talk about the research, but remember, every one of you has your own story. And I hope you help us at the USO and all the other military nonprofits here help us understand that story better. You can help improve what we've, what we've started here. Um, how, do, how do you follow, follow Ellen Dunford and, you know, Brittany? I mean, that's uh, kind of a hard thing to do. I, I don't have any heart-wrenching deployment stories. Um, well, actually, my wife and I did drag my wife, Christine, who's here, and she is the chair of the USO Service Council with Ellen Dunford. I, I dragged her, what, what did we do, four moves in three years, something like that. But it's nothing compared to what military spouses uh, go through. But it is a little bit of empathy uh, that I have there. I also want to thank Politico for helping us support uh, this activity today. I think it's going to be uh, a real game changer. Um, before I finish very brief remarks introducing the panel. I also want to specifically thank several organizations and recognize them who are in our audience today who have been trailblazers in helping to support military spouses and military spouse research. Uh, first of all, uh, Blue Star Families, thank you so much for everything that you do. Hiring Our Heroes, I think, is here with us today. The National Military Family Association and the Military Family Advisory Network and of course, the Institute for Veterans and Military Affairs at Syracuse University. So thank you all for the groundbreaking research that you have done uh, a year in, year out. Thank you. So why do we do this? Um, through this research, we think we're better equipped to communicate with, build programs around, and ultimately serve military spouse community in a richer and more fulfilling way. Military spouses are the backbone of our military. Their well-being and their ability to thrive not only impacts the prosperity of military families, and I know that's your principal concern, but also has, in my judgment, a profound effect on our national defense. Um, we're here today to recognize the unique and critical role that military spouses play in our national defense as well as our country writ large. Now, some of you have heard me say before that a strong America is a force for good in the world. I believe that. And I also believe that we have to have a strong military to protect our freedoms and our way of life. But in order to maintain that strong military, we need to ensure that our military spouses are strong as they carry much of the burden associated with military life. So right now, there are, believe it or not, there are almost 650,000 military spouses. It's an amazing number, a big change over what it was in years past. Uh, these spouses have enormous pressure placed on them to include raising a family during long deployments as well as you know, the frequent movements around the world um, or, or, even, or even around the base, right? According to a recent study conducted by Hiring Our Heroes, um, 
their service, 81% uh, of military spouses and their service member have discussed the possibility of leaving the military. That's not surprising. Eventually, everybody transitions out. But that is a high number, and it's a warning sign that we need to think about. To maintain a strong all-volunteer all force, we need to ensure that both our service members and their spouses and families uh, feel that the military is an advantageous career opportunity for the entire family. If we cannot ensure this, we put at risk that strong military that protects our way of life. That's why I think this is actually a national security issue in addition to being the right thing to do for military spouses. As military nonprofits, we need to focus our programming and effort on military spouses and ensure we're doing everything we can to support them. And to that end, this past summer, we at the USO contracted a research team to delve into the population. You know, that has been historically viewed in a very monolithic way, the military spouse, as though that's one thing. While many programs and services have been designed for military spouses, they sometimes only address one version of the military spouse or certain needs, leaving many individuals well outside the reach of what could be uh, impactful supporting services. So this research is really an effort. Uh, it was, uh, the research effort was intended to develop this deep and multi-dimensional view of military spouses. And, you know, we know that our military spouse community is very diverse, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera. But our research has shown that they share some unique personas, uh, and, and this, this, you'll see this, this came out in the research, and I think it's really important that we remember that our military spouses are strong individuals, and they have much to give back to the nation. This is not a matter of providing a handout. It's a matter of making sure that, that we're empowering them so that they can do all I, they are doing and, and more uh, to support our country, to support our communities, and of course, for their families to thrive. So it's really imperative we support them in this, in this, in this respect. So spouses, this day is for you. We hope you enjoy it. Uh, to everyone joining the conversation, thank you for all you do to support the men and women in the armed forces and their families. Uh, and I am now very proud to be able to introduce Chris Marvin, the principal at Marvin Strategies, to lead the USO panel called Research Unveiled, the U.S. Spouse Discovery Tour. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning. I I'm really excited to be here uh, because they asked me, uh, I'm Chris, and they asked me to talk about the research that I did, something I've spent the last uh, six months working on. So it's, it's very exciting for me to get a chance to share some of these ideas, uh, the things that I learned with, with you all, um, but also because I get to sit up here with uh, two people that are not only military spouses, but are also subject matter experts in the area. Uh, and discuss this with them. Um, and so I'd love for, uh, before I talk about this report, um, I'd love for each of uh, my distinguished panelists to introduce themselves to you. Shannon. Hi everyone, my name is Shannon Razadin. I'm the Executive Director of the Military Family Advisory Network. I'm a mom of two, so I have an eight month old and a two and a half year old. We PCS recently uh, up to Newport, Rhode Island. and. Um, I'm very much living this life. I feel incredibly privileged to lead the Military Family Advisory Network and bring together a really diverse group of military spouses and through our research, learn how to best partner with other organizations and make sure we are all supported in this life and we're all able to do everything that we want to do as people. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Zabriskie and I am a Programs Manager at the USO. My husband's active duty army, and we have been in this area about 18 months. 
Um, and I've been very fortunate to get a job at the USO. I was uh, unemployed for several years, which was really difficult for me, not unusual in the military spouse community. So it's been a privilege and an honor to be able to serve our military families um, in this capacity, and I'm looking forward to finding more ways that we can serve them as well. See, they did a better job of introducing themselves than I could have, and plus, I can't pronounce either of their last names. <laughs> <coughs> they both have Z's in their last names. <laughs> Um, but I'm Chris Marvin, I'm the principal of Marvin Strategies, uh, I'm an Army veteran, um, and I was really pleased to uh, get a call from USO uh, earlier this year uh, with this idea that they wanted to do some research on military spouses and try to understand them. And we immediately talked uh, about something that JD mentioned, which is that it's not the military spouse. The military spouse doesn't do something, he, well she, is not as a he or she, but if you're being stereotypical, everyone says it's she is this and she is that. There's plenty of he's, there's plenty of uh, diverse backgrounds, and the idea that we could do research that would unlock that idea uh, that the military spouse is not a monolith, that it's military spouses that occupy various different you know, ranges of, of, of work and lifestyle and, and personas, um, uh, that was exciting for me. Um, I was able to bring on a, a partner on this research. Uh, her name is Amber Slining. Um, she's standing over here by the table. If everyone wants to give Amber a quick round of applause for the work that she did on this project. Um, Amber's an expert in human-centered design with a background. Uh, she came from the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, VA Center for Innovation, did work there in the veteran space, and was able to translate that really well for this project into the military spouse community. Uh, and what we did to, to produce this report called The Backbone of Our Military, uh, perceptions and experiences from modern military spouses um, is that we went all over the world, as you heard. We went to Southern California, uh, the Pacific Northwest, Texas, Hawaii, Japan, to capture all different types of military spouses from different backgrounds. Uh, we did interviews uh, with more than 50 military spouses uh, in group and individual settings, um, a lot, especially towards the end, a lot of individual interviews where we got really deep with folks. And what we were doing uh, from a human-centered design process, we were trying to listen, right? We were trying to hear the voices of individual spouses and then synthesize that together and understand how we could convey uh, the voices of many diverse military spouses. Um, and what we came up with was, was this report. Um, it's kind of anchored by three, uh, three major themes that, that I'll share with you briefly, and then underneath each theme, uh, there were some insights. We have 10 insights altogether that when you get your hands on this report, um, I believe there's going to be a one-pager available at the event today that has all 10 of our insights. Um, some of them are going to be common sense to you, and some of them are maybe new and novel, and, and uh, both of those things are good. Uh, but the three themes and things we'll get into with our discussion today uh, include, um, I, maybe a better way to think of these is areas of importance um, for military spouses. The first is identity and sense of purpose. Right? You need to have a strong identity, know your sense of purpose. When you have that, you're strong, and, and when you don't, it's problematic. The second theme was networks and support systems are really important. Again, pretty common sense, but obviously a challenge as you move from place to place, and uh, when strong support systems aren't there, things are more difficult. And the third theme was that, uh, that spouses seek agency and the ability to plan, and it's very hard to plan your life uh, when you can only see past you know, the next PCS move. Um, thinking about things like retirement, those, those questions become more and more difficult um, in an itinerant lifestyle. Uh, so hopefully you'll get a chance to, to read this whole report, uh, find it online when it's available, um, read all 10 insights in depth, understand well, the voices that we heard. You'll see that the report is punctuated all over by quotes from real military spouses, because this isn't just another, um, uh, this isn't data or quantitative focus. This is a qualitative report meant to show the voice of spouses. Um, and then finally, in the back of our report, uh, we created four personas. And for those of you that have been up the ramp, you'll see those four personas on a big poster. Um, they represent just a bit of the diversity that military, the military spouse community has um, and starting to break away from that monolithic view. Um, but since I'm talking so much about the voices of military spouses, I should uh, quiet my voice and let some of our military spouses actually share theirs. Um, and so, uh, Shannon, I'd love to start with you. Um, you obviously work professionally in advocacy for, um, for military families and spouses. 
Um, I'm just interested to hear what aspects of this report and of this kind of, kind of work have resonated most with you. Sure, so what I appreciate most is the fact that when I was reading it, nothing to me stood out um, as, oh my gosh, this is a huge surprise. Um, and, and that's important because the research that we do, we also do qualitative research. Um, other organizations do fantastic research. And I think that by bringing together all these different types of studies, we're able to get a better picture and a better understanding of what being a military spouse looks like. And I think the thing that's important is you also talk to people who might not self-identify as a military spouse. That might be like the fourth or fifth identifier that they use to maybe describe themselves. And that's really important that you know people have their own identity and you were able to hear from people who you know, might not always be connected to the programs and the resources that are out there and available. Um, but I thought it was really well done. I'm, I'm excited to get this in the hands of, of more people um, and so that we can all take this and digest it and figure out how we can work together to really address the needs of military families because there isn't a one size fits all solution. And the people that you all captured um, in your research, maybe we didn't and maybe other organizations didn't. And so we can all really work together and pull these different reports together to get a better understanding of who military spouses and military families really are. And I think that speaks to uh, the USO and their approach here, and a lot of credit to the USO for, for sharing this publicly. Um, they, they could have brought this report and used it internally to right. work on their own programs, and they will. That's what they've talked about. That's fantastic. But the idea that we're talking about your organization and other organizations that can also use this information, that, that makes me proud as, as someone who spent a lot of time talking to spouses and can share this. Um, now, Laura, you received this report in two capacities, right? First, as an employee of the USO. Uh, who works on um, uh, uh, military spouse programs, uh, but also as an active duty Army spouse. And so I'm interested to know sort of what your initial reactions are, but more specifically what you hope happens uh, with some of this information. Sure. Yeah, um, when I first heard that we were commissioning the research, I was a little bit skeptical. I've read so many different surveys and so many different reports, and I didn't know that there would be anything new that would be offered. Um, when I first read the report, it was, I, I had to put it down and digest it even later that evening because there were so many points brought up and different personas that I couldn't believe they captured that I had always felt that I had never seen written down. It's like someone took a look at my diary, some of the, the different voices that were captured there. So that was really exciting to me, like sh to Shannon's point, that um, it wasn't necessarily earth shattering, but that they captured it so well especially things that I never said out loud. Um, I hope that not just the USO, but all the military spouse organizations out there, um, or just military service organizations out there with the DOD, we, we all look at this report and say, okay, we've heard this many, many times now. We've heard what these military spouses are saying. Are there challenges? What can we do to solve some of the problems? And I think some new programming ideas are gonna come out of it, and I, I think that we're going to pave a way ahead to solve the problems and not just keep talking about the problems, but actually make some headway. Yeah, it was a really validating report to was, read, yeah. you know, to recognize that I, in my experience, while it touches several of these personas, there are other people that are feeling the same thing. And um, that in and of itself, knowing that you're not alone in this life and that other people are facing the ch same challenges but also the same successes, um, that's great, um, and it really, I think, helps make life a little bit easier when you know that you're not in an alum. That's great. You know, the truth is, the most challenging part of the report was getting Laura's diary back <laughs> into her top drawer <laughs> without her noticing that we'd taken That's no, that, where it was. Um, no, that, that means a lot to us that, 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 that you saw yourself in this. Um, and, and I think we saw you guys, too, um, as, as representative of a, of a certain type of military spouse, a certain persona. Now, for both of you, um, uh, you're employed currently, you're working, not all military spouses are working, unemployment rates are higher um, than the civilian population, underemployment as well, um, and there's not always opportunities to create that, that dual income household that is so normal in civilian life today uh, when, you're, when you're inside military life. So, um, you know, one of the insights we came up with is that, you know, meaningful employment can be challenging. Surprise, right? Um, you know, another one is that moving around so often is difficult. So some of our insights are not, they're not, they're not 
super novel, but we're, we're underlining these things and we're hopefully adding value. Um, I wonder for you guys if you wanted to talk about your, your careers and being a career-focused military spouse, what you've gone through, um, and I'd love to hear from both of you, that what you've gone through to, to, to get different jobs and to advance uh, on your own path. Sure. Um, so for me, it's been about reinventing myself and not being afraid to reinvent myself and trying to bring aspects of this life into um, what I am passionate about and you know different elements and experiences that I've had. So my background, um, I came to DC to uh, work on a master's in clinical mental health counseling, detoured that, ended up in an event planning role, went to a PR firm and moved to Spain happened. Um, and so I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to um, have people believe in, in me and my ability to start this organization, but it was a lot of risk and it was a lot of, um, you know, departure from what I had envisioned um, my life looking like and my professional identity being. Um, so I think that for me, when I'm talking to people, it's, you know, about seizing the opportunities that might be available um, and knowing that you can still find happiness and fulfillment even if that's not something that you had envisioned for yourself. Um, I'm very fortunate. It's not lost on me. I know there are a lot of people who are really um, challenged when it comes to employment um, and I think that that's something that a lot of organizations are really working hard together to, to crack the code on and then also recognizing that gainful employment doesn't necessarily mean working for someone else. You can work for yourself and we have a lot of passions and a lot of expertise and so how can we package all of that so that um, we are able to potentially take our own careers and, and move them um, as this life moves us. So for me, um, I'm very fortunate to have this job right now and I keep saying that because I didn't have gainful employment for a while. That was really hard for me. I, I had a great job up in New York City. I was climbing the corporate ladder when I decided to um, make a life with my now husband, who's active duty army. I knew it would be a challenge. I didn't go into it blind. I, I knew that military spouses didn't always have the easiest times transitioning their careers, but I was unprepared for how difficult it can be depending on where you are located, depending on the installation, the area, geographically. And when you're at a certain level and you have expectations that you will maintain that level, um, that's not always the case depending on where you are. So when we PCS to um, our last duty station, I had high hopes and I was hitting the ground running and it just wasn't working out for me uh, for probably a couple different reasons. One, I really wanted to maintain the level I was at. I didn't really want to kind of suck it up and go down a level for me personally, that was hard. And uh, two, people just found out I was a military spouse and my background's in HR and recruiting and I know that there are a lot of illegal questions that can be asked. They ask them anyway and it's extremely awkward to not want to say, not want to answer the question or say that that's an illegal question. So I turned to volunteering, which I think is what a lot of military spouses do and that was Fulfilling for me, it's, it filled that sense of identity that was missing, but that also created a gap on my resume that when we PCS to DC, I was thought, I thought, this is DC, they're gonna understand military spouses, they're gonna get my life, and I hit a lot of roadblocks coming back here with that gap on my resume. So, very fortunate to go to a USO military networking event that I had no idea about, but um, some friends told me about it and it led to this amazing position. So I would say to keep, you know, to Shannon's point, reinventing yourself, being okay to try different things, to take new risks is really important. And I, I am grateful and lucky for what I have now, but I just want to tell any other spouse out there that's still struggling, I've been there and it's going to get better. And I think with regard to employment, um, you know, the military has a long way to go when they think about spouses. Um, uh, some other research that's been done that we included in this report, but it was previously done by um, Boost Our Families and by the Bipartisan Policy Center, talked about this idea that in 1974, when the all-volunteer force was, was put into place, only 30%, or I think less than 30% of households in the U.S. Uh, were dual-income households. And that's more than doubled today, right, in the last 40-something years. Uh, now it's over 60%, but 
but the military community lags behind because we created that all volunteer force system in an era where that was the norm. And so the more that we can do, the more that USO and other organizations can do to try to change those cultural norms within the military community, the more it's gonna benefit talented people uh, you know, like Laura and Shannon. Um, and benefit all of us, really, and, and, and retention in national security, as JD brought up. Uh, Laura, you hit on something, uh, an insight that I think kind of gets overlooked sometimes, but it, maybe because it's so simple, um, but this idea that uh, expectations of military life don't often match reality. Um, and, and I want to read a quote, one of our spouse voices in this, in this one uh, is probably my favorite quote uh, that didn't have uh, swear words in it. And because um, there were some, we had to edit it. Um, but the spouses were being honest and raw, like that's important, right? We're getting the real feedback. But this one says, it, uh, it was from a female spouse, I think maybe in Texas somewhere, who said, I hate it when people say, you know what you were getting into because I didn't. That's what she said. I actually think I might have taken a swear word out of there before didn't, too. Um, and Laura, you told me yesterday that you grew up in a military family. Your father was in, in the military. Um, but it's different, right? You said he never deployed when you were a kid, but your husband's deployed five times or something like that. Um, so talk to us a little bit about what it's like to deal with the lack of stability and predictability that, that comes with, with military spouse life. Sure, yeah. Um, it's it's part of the deal, you know. It, it is that you do have to be flexible, and you hear the words resilient, flexible thrown out a lot for military spouses. Um, it's just it's kind of you know what's happening, but it's still hard to deal with. So my dad did not deploy. We were very fortunate in that regard. My husband has deployed a lot, lots of training cycles. Um, we've all we've been, all been through periods of separation, periods of picking up, uh, moving on. And things happen so quickly sometimes you don't always have a chance to prepare. For me, I actually just got news that my husband um, has to PCS again. He just left this past Sunday. Uh, very, very short notice, very quick. Um, still trying to wrap our heads around it, especially since this has been such an amazing time in my personal life. And I think that's just, that is what happens. So we, we, we get through it, we're resilient, um, we will make things work, but you just, you have to be open and flexible and adaptable to that lifestyle and trying to use your tribe, the people that you know that you can count on and work with to make it a little bit easier. I mean, I think that the flexible and adaptable, it came through in this survey over and over and over again, and it's why we called the, the study, uh, the report, the backbone of our military. Because I think first when you hear that, you think of like this strong, rigid backbone, right? It's like the center of the human body and it, may, it keeps you upright and walking. And we heard that over. People are, people are strong and they're resilient. But you also hear flexible all the time. And of course, that's what your spine is too, right? You can bend over and touch your toes, move back and forth. So the spine is both the strength as well as this flexibility. But the underlying piece we really wanted to imply about the backbone is that if you severely damage your backbone, your spinal cord, you're out of commission and you, know, you, you can die, right? And so when we think about the military spouse, that's how crucial military spouses are to, uh, you know, to, to our military. Um, and we wanted to really show that strength, flexibility, but also um, what can happen when damage is done. Um, you know, one of the things that, that you hear a lot of people talk about is, um, is how we need to throw resources at some of these issues, some of these problems. And you look at some of the resources that are thrown at um, veterans who are transitioning or service members who are transitioning to become veterans. And it occurred to us over and over again, honestly, that if you're a service, when I, I'm a, I, was, I was a service member, I transitioned into the military, and I transitioned out of the military. And that's where all the resources are, right? If you're a spouse in that same scenario, you transition into the military and out of the military, but in between you transition at every single PCS or deployment. There's these transitions, right? Now all these resources from nonprofits and the government are being thrown towards veteran transition without as much thrown towards military transition. Um, and that's got to be taxing, I think, on the, on, on the military spouse community. Um, and Shannon, I'd love you, for you to talk about um, what those transitions mean, um, how it can tax you from a mental health standpoint, 
um, what struggles you've seen people in your work face and, and how they got over them. Yeah, so I think one thing that's very real um, is an imposter syndrome um, within the military spouse space. So feeling like someone has it worse than you uh, and that can often put us in the role of being the, the provider, the helper, the you know, person who is putting your hand up and, and volunteering for things because someone has it more difficult than you. Someone's had more deployment. Someone's PCS more times. Uh, and that, I think, can cause us to put our own mental health and well-being on a back burner because there's someone else that has it worse than us. Um, and that's something that um, I have experienced. We haven't moved as many times. Um, my husband and I got married when he was a little bit later on in his career, so we haven't had as many deployments. And so um, I think that just recognizing that whatever your reality is, that's your, your reality, that's your truth, and just because it might not compare numbers-wise to someone else's doesn't mean um, it doesn't have its challenges and not being afraid to seek out that support. Uh, also knowing that there are a ton of resources that are out there, but they're not going to come to you. You know, you have to take that first step. You have to find the resources that are best suited for you. What one organization might have might be a great fit for one person, and it might be a horrible fit for someone else. And so that's why it is great that the, you know, the government, the DOD, Coast Guard, they provide resources, but then there are private organizations, there are nonprofits, there are for-profits that are providing resources for military spouses as well. And so just knowing that just because something doesn't work doesn't mean there isn't another program out there that's going to be a great fit for you. Uh, and not being afraid to also help others, you know, create that network as they're moving. If you've been stationed at a location um, and you see someone else come in, you know, we don't have as much of the mentoring matchup happening as people move. So not being afraid to, to offer that that handout and um, you know bring someone to a you know a dinner get together or invite someone to a, a book club or tell someone about a, you know a sports team that you know their kids might be interested in um, but yeah I mean I think those are the two big things that you have to seek things out for yourself and know that your reality is your truth and just because it might seem lesser than someone else's doesn't mean you don't deserve that time for yourself. You hit on something in the middle there. Um that actually addresses another one of these insights, which is great. You guys are, I didn't make them <laughs> plant the insights within their answers. They're just doing it, which is great, and I guess speaks to both their wisdom and hopefully the, the, the truth that's in this report. Um, but you talked about what we call it as well-intentioned well services breakdown and execution. I think if that's another one, it doesn't really make sense when you read it, but when you guys get your hands on the full report and you kind of dive into it, we're talking sometimes about FRGs and key spouse programs that are fantastic at one place and non-existent at another, right? Um, and we heard that a lot. Um, and, and really that sometimes for spouses when those services that are supposed to provide something, when they fail you at one location, you don't trust them the next time around, right? And so you're starting to erode and, and losing this trust in the system. That could be for nonprofits or for the government or for anybody else who's, who's interacting with spouses. Just like if you eat a bad meal at a restaurant, you're probably not going to go back to that restaurant. You don't want food poisoning again, right? So, so you learn your lesson quickly. Um, one of those well-intentioned services that I think sometimes breaks down turned out to be a, a whole nother insight. And Shannon, I'd like to drop this right back on you because you have kids. Um, and that's that sufficient child care is severely lacking, right? We heard this every single place we went. Um, and at one place, uh, a Marine Corps base, somewhere in the middle of the Pacific, which just won't be very specific, um, but right in the middle of the Pacific in a state. Um, <laughs> <coughs> they told us that they were pretty, and this isn't, this isn't it, like empirical qua quantitative evidence. This is just anecdotal, but more than one person said, we're pretty sure the only people that get child care are dual military which is great, and they should be number one priority because they're both in the military, I get that. But there has to be more childcare there, right? Um, and so I'd love to hear what you've heard from other spouses and your own experience with, with childcare and, and, and maybe what, what the system can do to make this well-intentioned service a little bit more uh, adequate. Yeah, so um, we were on a wait list for um, over a year. Um, didn't have a spot open for us, and then it was time to, to move. Uh, we didn't even bother um, you know, going on the list when we PCS because we knew that there was over a year and a half wait for kids that were around our age. 
Um, I think there are lots of organizations that are doing really great work to help kind of backfill that. So um, Armed Services YMCA and the YMCAs in general have, have great childcare opportunities. Um, but the thing that's important to remember is that there is a thread that goes through this, right? So it's not childcare in a vacuum. It's childcare impacts your ability to look for a job, you know, to go on interviews. It impacts your ability to, you know, take care of yourself and go to a doctor's appointment. Uh, I saw a few kids in the audience today, and I'm so excited to see a few kids in the audience today because that's that takes courage. That takes taking that step out. And I've done it several times when childcare has fallen through, and um, that's our reality. Childcare is, is a barrier right now, um, and it's something that, especially as you move and you're not living somewhere where you have family or you might know people or have people who can step in and help, or even just filling out the emergency contact form <laughs> at a school. I was like, so you're a military spouse, I'm a military spouse, will you be you know, my kids contact, uh, you know, if something, God forbid, were to happen. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's work to be done. There's work to be done in a lot of areas. I think that there are opportunities to work with um, other outside organizations who are doing great work and providing great alternative options, but also not losing sight of sometimes you just need a break and you need a few hours. And it's not necessarily for, you know, full time, long day. Sometimes you just need to go to the doctors or you need to get your hair done or like take a little bit of self care time. And, um, you know, child care can be a real barrier uh, for that. I think, I think to mix two things you said. Uh, number, number one, we kept. We kept finding people that have this bigger notion of childcare too. It's, it's yes, it's a drop-in childcare is an issue. Yes, it's so that I can go do a, a volunteer activity or go shopping. But also, people would say, if I had childcare, I could work, yeah. right? I could create that dual-income household. Um, in in that dual-income household, um, my family would have more money than any bonus or pay raise the Pentagon could give my service member spouse. If I could have a job, then we would be better off and more likely to stay in the military, right? And if, you're, if that person says more likely to stay in the military, then their service member spouse is going to stay in the military too, and now we have a better fighting force, right? So again, as, as, as JD mentioned earlier, there's a straight line from childcare to national security in this case, which is, which is super interesting and I think often overlooked. Um, now with um, with the emergency contact one, you, again, the quote, the quote from Insight 4, Insight 4, by the way, is trusted relationships are valued but elusive. Um, and, and, it, and it pairs nicely with Insight 5, which is that networks are difficult to maintain. One of those is sort of social, one of those is sort of professional, but there's this idea of networks and support systems. The quote is that uh, there are people here so different from myself, and you just meet them. And the next week, they are your emergency contact. <laughs> These are accelerated relationships. Um, and I think uh, Laura from the USO told us yesterday that when she moved, her most recent move, she's a military spouse, uh, Air Force spouse, and when she moved recently, um, she was signing her child up for, for, for daycare and put down her realtor as, as an emergency contact. <laughs> she didn't know anybody else in the region. She knew her realtor. Yeah. And that, that, that ring, you're laughing because it rings so true, right? Um, uh, but Laura, I'd like to just ask you about those, those accelerated relationships, the importance of support systems, networks, and and what that means as, as you're about to PCS again to yeah. somewhere you never lived before. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, we all know how important relationships are just for our emotional and mental well-being. They can be elusive in the military spouse community. I'm fortunate. I'm a big extrovert, and I like to meet people, and I like to talk to people. That doesn't always make it any easier when you're brand new and you don't know anyone. And, um, you know, I think for us, we're lucky we have the social media today that has been huge for military spouses in particular, just staying connected with people that we've met, even if it's been for only a few months. Um, and also just there, there is, I do think we're at the cusp of a kind of a movement for military spouses where we are all working to lift each other up, to be there, to say, hey, you know, we have this spouses group or we have a um, child, baseball team group here in my new duty station come out and come join us. So I do see that happening a lot more. I have friends that have had a lot better experiences than I used to have just with the onset of social media to be able to help with that. 
Um, in terms of actual friends, you know, they, they can take a while. It takes a while to make meaningful friendships. And sometimes that's a hit or miss where you're stationed and, and who you meet and what your um, service member does and the role that they are, the rank they are. So it's, it's challenging, but ultimately we all are in it together. And I do think that we are at this point where a lot of women, especially women, um, but males too, just trying to lift each other up and pull each other to different groups, like you were saying, Shannon. I have seen that a lot, so that's exciting. Yeah. I think that um, we'll move on now to probably one of my favorite parts of the report and something that when you all get your hands on this, I hope you spend some time looking at, or you now can again go up and look at that poster, which is the personas. Um, I'm briefly going to introduce each of the personas, um, but you're going to have to dive into them to, to learn about them. The reason these personas are here is because this report is designed for anybody to, to take on their own and, and, and take action, right? Not just the USO. Um, like I said, a lot of credit to the USO for making this public and putting it out there. Um, but for the USO, for USO centers around the, around the country and the world, but also for individual military spouses, for you know, groups of spouses at a specific base, for FRGs, for whatever uh, groups of folks might want to put this together, and design something, a program, an initiative, an intervention, whatever it is, that you design these, you design these um, initiatives based on real people, not data, right? So for each of these personas, we have a photo, and we have a first-person narrative, and we talk about each of them. And we only put four. We, there could have been more, because there are more personas in this. And these don't represent, we don't expect spouses to fit into one of these. We expect, ex, expect spouses to sometimes be this persona and sometimes be that persona. When they grow a little bit older and more experienced, there'll be another persona. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about them briefly and then and have each of you maybe comment just for a moment before we uh, walk off stage. The first one is proudly serving, right? It's that spouse that, you know, really supports his or her service member and, and, and is, is, is proudly serving from the, from the very beginning. Um, the second one is my dreams, my path. The person who is um, dedicated to having their own career and path and isn't going to let the, the military spouse lifestyle get in their way. Um, the third is making ends meet, right? Those who are just trying to make sure that food's on the table and the bills are paid. Um, and, and that's obviously a, a crucial one. And the fourth one is searching for my tribe. Um, that one is those military spouses that not only are not different from the sort of archetype, but really don't fit with the majority of military spouses, LGBT spouses, male spouses, sometimes prior service members all fit into searching for my tribe. Um, and so when programs are designed, we really are encouraging folks who are using this tool um, to look at those personas and think about the real human beings that they represent. Um, and maybe to conclude, I'd love each of you to briefly say what personas resonated for you or did you see in yourself when you first took a look at this report? Sure. Um, so for me, I think uh, proudly serving really spoke to me just because as hard as this life is, I would do it again in a heartbeat. I would um, proudly marry my husband again and, and do this crazy world. <laughs> if he's listening, he knows that. No, but um, it, that, that really resonated with me because it is hard and it is difficult. And I, you know, I don't want sympathy. I, I don't need people to feel sorry for me, but I am very proud to be serving alongside of him and uh, what he does. So that one really spoke to me. Also, my dreams, my path, because I do see that person that was someone, and they feel that they aren't that person anymore and that they want to be that person again. And I think you can have that as well. Um, you just have to work a little harder at it. I definitely uh, fit or, you know, with both of those. I think that for me right now also, it's I'm a little bit with the Finding My Tribe um, place, which um, it's a moment in time piece for me. I just recently PCS'd, I'm working from home for the first time and feeling, uh, second time actually, but feeling a little bit isolated. Um, and then um, having a hard, harder time making connections because a lot of people that I'm around um, they're socializing and doing things during the day. They're not working, and so I'm having a little bit of a harder time making those meaningful friendships. Um, and that's something that I also faced when we were in Rota, Spain. Um, a little bit less in DC, but um, I'm really proud of what I'm doing. 
I'll get in trouble if I say I would marry my husband again too. Um, yeah. <laughs> But um, it's, a, it's a great life. It's a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities. And um, I think that one thing I really appreciate is we're all in this experience together. We all share this life, and we all um, can be there to support each other. You know, sometimes you see some negative things posted on social media or just out, you know, out there. And I think that the more that we can stand together and support each other and um, you know, create an environment of zero tolerance for that type of conversation, um, the better and healthier our military spouses will be in the future of our all-volunteer force. That's awesome. Um, that's our time. Um, I'd love to, to thank Laura and Shannon for sharing their own stories with us. Um, thank the USO and all the sponsors here today. Uh, again, my partner on this project, Amber, um, who's answering all the questions. I'm not answering any of them. Um, <laughs> And, and mostly uh, thank the military spouses who are here and who are watching and, and who are going to read this report and, and other um, interact with USO and other organizations later. Thank you for being the backbone of our military. Thank you.